Whether you're just getting started with watercolor pencils and you're looking for a step-by-step -step tutorial, or you're a little bit more advanced and you're looking to learn new methods and techniques to help you arrive at better results more consistently, this one is for you. In this week's video, I am taking you through my full painting process for this watercolor pencil cupcake illustration. And by the way, I'm going to be using student grade watercolor pencils from my Gold Faber Aqua set from Faber Castell, because I do want to show you that you can arrive at great results using student grade supplies. Especially when it comes to watercolor pencils, professional ones can be incredibly expensive. I'm going to be letting you into my four phase process and sharing my favorite techniques that help me arrive at a level of realism that I enjoy while also bringing in a certain level of looseness and expression. If you'd like to grab my outline sketch so that you can follow along with this tutorial, I'm going to make sure to leave a link to where you can download that down below in the description box. All right, with all that said, let's jump in. So getting started with my first layer. The objective with layer number one is to develop those lightest values all throughout the cupcake. I always make my way from lights to darks and I work in layers incrementally pushing that contrast that is going to enable me to create that believable sensation of 3D form and light and shadow. So what you're seeing me do right here is I'm going in with my cadmium yellow, which is the lightest color that I have chosen to develop my different values and hues throughout the spongy cake section along the top that we're able to see where that is not covered by icing. And also some of the cake that we're able to see through the transparent paper cup. So you can see me go in and develop this first layer with my yellow. And I'm not exerting very much pressure at all as I am doing my layering. In fact, I don't start pressing down until the last layer where I'm really looking to push those darkest dark areas. Right here, I'm done with that first lightest layer all throughout the cake. And because I have this yellow in my hand, I just take a quick second to also go into the yellow candies at the top and develop that layer there. With that first lightest layer in, I go ahead and change to my second color, which in my case, it's burnt ochre, which is a light brown. And I'm going in and I'm starting to layer this color over mid-tone and darkest dark sections that I'm able to see in that reference photo. I'm trying to leave little sections where that previous yellow is shining through uncovered by the second color, especially where I'm able to see that very bright yellow or light values in that reference photo. When I see this reference photo, I get the sense that the light is hitting this cupcake from the left. If you notice in that reference photo, we're able to see that cast shadow on the surface of the table on the lower right. And there are, generally speaking, darker values throughout the pink icing at the top on the right as well. So this is why I come to a conclusion that the light source is on the left. And this is something that is essential to have in mind throughout this shading process and as you're developing your different values, because you do want to keep that light consistent throughout the piece if you're looking for mid to higher levels of realism. But the three dimensionality and the volume and the plain changes of what you're seeing and how things are overlapping over each other and creating shadows on each other are also important to have in mind as you're moving forward with your shading process. Right here, I switched to my darkest color, which is my dark brown, which in my case, it's Van Dyke brown. And what I'm doing with this darkest color is I'm doing more layering, but this time I'm only layering this darkest color on darkest shadow areas that I'm able to see in that reference photo. Think of what you are shading in as a three-dimensional structure sitting in space being affected by light. There are planes that are facing toward the light. There are planes that are facing away from the light. And there are also elements that are blocking that light from hitting sections of other elements behind them or underneath them. 
And all of these things are essential to have in mind as you move forward. It's actually pretty impressive how we're able to arrive at higher levels of realism when we have these essential things in mind. We don't have to stress about creating a photocopy of what we're seeing in that reference photo to arrive at realistic results. By having these things in mind, we can even work a little bit faster and make some artistic choices and even make things a little bit more expressive and still arrive at realistic results without the added stress. Here I'm continuing to layer on that darker brown in some dark areas that I'm able to see throughout that paper cup. Consider the sections that are a little bit more sunken in or that are being covered by those triangular sections of paper that are popping out. These are abstract, irregular shadow shapes that I am creating here. Not lines, not super heavy, solid dark shapes, but irregular abstract shadow shapes. I'm not pressing down hard at all, and I am releasing that pressure as I make my way out into lighter value areas. And when it comes to the upper section, I added that darker brown, especially under the icing, where that icing would be creating a shadow on that spongy cake. And with those three colors in, it was time to switch on over to doing some work with my gray. So I have my lighter gray on hand here which is warm gray four. And right here, I'm only doing some quick addition of this gray in little shadow shapes that I'm able to see throughout the paper cup sections, those little triangular sections that are popping out. I don't wanna go in and just cover up all of those white sections with gray because in these areas, I want to incorporate that white paper as part of the piece to help me create that illusion of white paper. If I go in and cover all of that up with gray, it's gonna look like gray paper and I want that paper to look white. The gray is only added to those shadow areas. It's the same when we're working with traditional watercolor paint. No white paint is necessary because you're using the white bright paper to help you develop those very light values, such as those bright shapes created by the brightest highlights and also the light values created by white objects, white fur, white feathers, whatever the case may be. All right, I was done with my initial layering of color in the cake sections, and now it was time to move on to doing my layering in the icing and the cherry. The first layer in both of these elements was created with my pink, which for me is dark flesh from my favorite castell set. I first went in with this pink all throughout the icing and the cherry, except for those highlight sections meaning I didn't add in any color into those brightest bright areas that I'm able to see in that reference photo throughout the icing and the cherry. Because just like what I was explaining with the paper cup, I want to incorporate the brightness and the whiteness of the paper to help me communicate those brightest highlights. Especially when it comes to the cherry, I want to make sure that I leave bright white paper shining through uncovered to help me create those highlights because this is what's going to make the cherry look moist and shiny. But you can see how my highlight shapes are not even exactly the same as the highlight shapes present in that reference photo. As long as they are similar in shape, location, and size, I'm still going to end up with believable results. And a little tip that I want to provide here is as long as you haven't activated that pigment with water and a paintbrush, you can go in and do some lifting and erasing out with a soft, regular graphite eraser. So if you find that you've overly layered or darkened pigment or color in bright highlight sections, you can always go in and erase some of that pigment back up. Just make sure that your eraser is nice and clean because you don't want to muddy up your color with graphite. Once I had my initial lightest color in, which was the pink in the icing and the cherry, I switched to my red, which is my permanent carmine, and I did some layering over mid-tone and darkest dark sections. And for my icing, I switched to my purple pink, and I started developing my mid-tones and darkest darks, with the second darker color. Along the way, I'm continuing to observe my reference photo to get clues and ideas as to where my different value shapes are located 
and I continue asking myself, is this area here lighter or darker than this other area over here? Noticing the relationships between the different value areas or shapes present is what's ultimately most important and trying to get that in your drawing or painting to the best of your abilities. I'm also trying to observe where different value shapes end with a sharp defined edge and where soft transitions between values are taking place. There is always going to be a combination of sharp defined edges and soft lost edges in realism. So try to pinpoint those in the reference photo in order to make them happen in your drawings or paintings. Okay, so I'm finishing up with my overlapping with my second darker color in the icing that I'm using in those shadow areas, which is the purple pink. And right here, I'm taking a quick sec to create my first layer in the rest of the sprinkled candy on top. The candy sprinkle shapes are pretty small, so all I'm going to be doing for those is using one single color in each. I still want to develop at least a subtle range of values within the little candies, but because these little forms are so small, I'm just going to be using one single color in each. First starting with a very light placement of that pigment, and later on with my subsequent layering, I'm going to be developing darker values by bringing in that same color that I used for my first pale initial layering, but saturating or layering that color, applying it in a slightly thicker state to cover up more paper in little shadow sections. There are some little white candy sprinkles, and for those I brought in my light gray, and I'm just applying it very lightly in little sections here and there, making sure that I am leaving some sections of paper shining through uncovered, because again, those are white objects. To finish up with my initial layering of color, I go ahead and fill in the cast shadow shape on the surface of the table with my light gray. And with that, I'm all done with that initial layering of color all throughout this illustration. So as you can see, I've already managed to develop a nice range of light values, but everything is still looking pretty pale. It's still lacking a lot of contrast, and that's what we're going to be doing with the next layers. But for now, I'm happy with that range of values that I've developed, and there is already a good amount of pigment on my paper that I can move on to my first activation of color. I bring out my container of water and a small watercolor paintbrush. This is a size three round, and I'm gonna get started with my color activation. Taking a little bit of water at a time from my container, I gently run the damp bristles of my paintbrush over this pigment that I'm wanting to activate. And as you can see, as I activate this pigment, it becomes brighter and sometimes even darker, and I arrive at somewhat more painterly effects. Colors start melting into each other, creating softer transitions, and some of the texture that was left behind by the pencil is kind of melting and diffusing out. This said, my objective with this color activation is not to completely get rid of the texture left behind by the pencil. You can see how I'm moving through this activation process pretty quickly. I am not spending too long in any single area. I don't want to start overworking my piece or damaging my paper with too much scrubbing. And I actually really like incorporating a bit of that sketchiness and texture left behind by the pencil application and combining that with more painterly effects that watercolor pencils also allow. I do want to make sure to provide a few tips that can help you with your color activation because it did take me a while to get used to this. To begin, you only need a small amount of water to do your activation when you're using watercolor pencils. So make sure that you're staying on top of water control and that you're not bringing out too much water and dripping it all over your piece. As you can see, I am constantly dabbing the tip of my paintbrush on my absorbent towel that I have right there to the left. And every time I go into my container of water, I gently scrape the bristles of my paintbrush along the top lip there to get rid of that excess drippage. Another thing that I want to recommend is working from light areas toward darker areas. 
because as you continue activating your pigment, more and more color is getting collected in your paintbrush bristles. And if you start in those darkest areas and you go toward the light areas, you're gonna push or pull that darker color into those lighter value areas and you're gonna darken them too much. On the other hand, if you start with the lighter areas and you make your way toward the darker areas, there is going to be a less amount of pigment in your paintbrush bristles as you're sweeping into those darker areas because lighter areas have a less amount of pigment in them and they also have a lighter color in them which is not going to eat up the darker color the darker color is going to eat up the lighter color but the lighter color is not going to eat up the darker color so the worst thing that can happen is that you may have to darken areas again with subsequent layering but at least you're not getting rid of those very much needed lighter areas because we do need a wide range of values to develop a believable sense of 3d-ness we do need lightest areas a wide range of midtones, and darkest darks so have those different value shapes or areas in mind as you continue moving on with your activation and make sure that you are paying attention to how you're pushing and pulling that color around. And lastly, I'm always making sure to rinse out my paintbrush bristles in between colors or in between areas of my piece. Meaning if I feel I have green or blue in my paintbrush, I'm not gonna do my activation in the pink areas. Or if I feel I have a brown in my paintbrush, I'm not gonna do the activation in the pink area. Areas. This helps keep my colors clean and vibrant. I don't want to start creating browns by mixing complementary colors together and that kind of thing. So make sure that you continue rinsing out your paintbrush bristles as you go. To finish up my first color activation, I switched on over to my size 14 round brush to do the activation in the cast shadow shape because that is a larger shape and it would be too frustrating to go in to activate that with my smaller brush. And with that, I'm all done with layer one. I allowed everything to dry completely and it was time to get started with layer number two. As I said before, as we're moving on with our layering process, we're incrementally making our way toward those darkest darks. Getting started with the cake sections, I go right in with my medium color that I chose for these areas, which is my lighter brown. In my case, this is burnt ochre. And what I am doing here is I am just applying more of this color in mid-tone and darkest dark areas, and I am allowing the previous lighter layer to shine through those lighter value sections, meaning I am just overlapping or layering on more pigment in areas that I'm looking to push or darken more. And at this point, I am looking to start developing a little bit more texture in that upper part where we're able to see the cake so I do use a scribbling technique in that area as I continue developing those values. I then move on to do some layering in the bottom part where we're able to see some of that cake color through the transparent paper cup. I know that these sections can be overwhelming to work through. There's a lot going on. But I again want to remind you to think of the three dimensional structure or form of what it is that you are shading in. So it's kind of like a zigzag. There's a little triangular section coming out and a little section that recedes, another section that is coming out and another section that recedes, right? Have that in mind as you're doing your shading. Usually those sections that are farthest away from the light or sections that are sunken in are going to have a darker value than the sections that are coming out and are catching more light. However, do remember that the light is hitting this cupcake from the left. And this is also going to have an impact on the shadows that we see created by these little triangular sections that are coming out. The shadows created by these triangular segments that are coming out of this paper cup are going to be different on the left versus the right because the shadow is going to be behind that triangular section whereas in the middle of that paper cup it's more symmetrical shadows are going to be on either side of that triangular thing that is coming toward you it's important to remember that this paper cup is wrapping around 
a tapered cylinder. Right here, I have moved on to using my darkest color, which is the dark brown. In my case, this is Van Dyke Brown and I just apply this darker brown in those darkest sections. It is very important to continue acknowledging all of these deepest, darkest shadow areas as abstract, irregular shapes, especially when we're using those darkest colors. We don't want to go in and start creating lines because there are no lines in realism. Here I'm going back to my medium brown and I'm just working on transitions a little bit more. You can always go back to your previous lighter color if you need to work on transitions. If you go in with your darkest color and things are looking a little bit too stark, switch on over to your medium color and create a bridge tone or transition between lighter value areas and darkest value areas. Yes, the general strategy is to work from lights to darks, but if you have to go back to a lighter color to work on transitions, to make highlight shapes a little bit smaller, whatever the case may be, you can always go back to those lighter colors. What's important here is that the color that you have in your hand is adequate for what you're trying to do. Are you trying to develop a lighter value? Then make sure to use your lighter color that you chose for the area on hand. Are you trying to develop a darker value? Then make sure to switch on over to the darker color that you have chosen for that area. Right here, I am darkening those upper little holes created by those triangular sections that are coming out along the top of this paper cup. And you can see how in the middle and right, I darkened that with the dark brown, whereas on the left, I darkened those sections with my medium brown to communicate that fact that the light is hitting this cupcake from the left. As I move on with my second layering and then my third layering, I am doing my best to not apply any more color in light value areas that I want to keep protected. Because I know that if I go in and do more layering in those areas, I'm gonna get rid of the lightness and glow that I want to arrive at, and things are also going to look flat and they're gonna lack dimension. After doing that work in the cake and the paper cup, it was time to do my second layering of color in the icing and the cherry. So I go back to my pink, which is my lighter color that I have chosen for the icing. And I am working on doing more layering with this lighter color, especially in mid-tone and darkest dark areas before moving on to my darker color. So this is dark flesh that I'm using right now. I'm working on transitions and making little highlight sections a little bit smaller and intensifying the pink overall. Once I did that, I switched on over to my darker color that I chose for the icing, which is my purple pink. And I'm only applying this darker color in those shadow areas in the icing. Sometimes when it comes to the icing and even the paper cup areas, it's helpful to zoom into the reference photo to really notice what's going on. I find zooming into specific parts of that reference photo that you're working on makes things less overwhelming and helps you focus on those areas. Finishing up with my purple pink here, noticing all those shadows and little crevices and nooks and crannies throughout the icing in that reference photo, maybe even little shadows created by the candy sprinkles. And then it was time to do my layering in the cherry. So I switched on over to my permanent carmine and I am applying more of this color in those mid-tone and darkest dark areas that I see in the cherry, really doing my best to keep those brightest highlight areas protected. And also you can see how I've left little shapes where that previous lighter red slash pink is shining through uncovered by this second layering. And finally, it's time to do that second layer in the little candy sprinkles. So as I mentioned before, I'm just gonna be using the same color that I was using before for all of these little circular forms for these candies. Only this time, I'm developing those darker areas, those little shadow shapes. So I'm applying the same color that I was using previously, but I'm just going in and doing layering in little darker areas that I want to develop. By layering on more color in those darker areas, 
we're covering up more paper and this creates a darker value. Areas where I've applied the color more lightly are going to look lighter. And this is all with the intention of creating a bit of a range of values even within these very small elements in my illustration. And just as a reminder, as we go in and continue developing these smaller, darker shapes, it's very important that you continue sharpening your pencils. To finish up with my second layering of pigment, I go ahead and take my darker gray. This is cold gray four, and I do more layering using this gray in the cast shadow shape under the cupcake. This time though, I wanna focus on darkening the area of occlusion shadow nearest the cupcake, which is an area within the larger cast shadow shape that is usually darker. And this is because the the object is blocking that light from hitting that section entirely and no reflected light is able to reach that section either. Once that was done, it was time to move on to my second activation of pigment. So I once again brought out my container of water and my paintbrushes, and I'm doing the exact same thing that I was doing before, bringing to mind all of those important tips making sure that I'm only taking a small amount of water at a time from my container, using my absorbent towel to stay on top of water control, doing my best to work from lights to darks, making sure that I'm paying attention to how I'm pushing and pulling that pigment around on my paper, and also having in mind the values that I've already started to develop in all of these different areas. I don't want to mindlessly start going back and forth with my paintbrush and destroy all of the work that I've done with my value development so far. Right here, you can see how as I'm doing my color activation with my size three round brush in this visible cake portion of the cupcake, I'm also using little scribbling motions to help me describe a little bit of that cake texture. Whereas in other sections, I use more sweeping motions. I'm also doing my best to keep those brightest highlight areas and also those sections that I want to make look white protected and uncovered with any pigment. Continue rinsing out your paintbrush as you go, making sure that you're working with clean bristles as much as possible. I'm also making sure that I am not spending too much time in any single area trying to get rid of that texture created by the pencil. That is not the point here. I don't want to arrive at over worked results. When it comes to this second color activation, you should be able to do it at least a little bit faster than the first because really you're only activating those areas where you just applied more pigment with that layering that you just did before, which were smaller, darker shapes inside of those larger, lighter shapes. Whereas when you activated that pigment after the first layering of color, meaning during that first pigment activation that we did, you are activating the entire thing, except for, of course, the highlight areas where you didn't apply any color. Okay, so right here I'm doing my activation of color in the cherry, and I'm doing my best to keep those bright highlights protected. And you can also see how I left some sections where only the pink is showing through. So I would say I have at least three to four different values within that cherry, which is what's going to provide that sense of 3D-ness and light and shadow. I removed all of that red from my paintbrush bristles, and what I'm finishing up with here is my quick activation of those little teeny tiny shadow areas within the candies. And because these candies are different colors, I'm making sure to rinse out my paintbrush bristles when I switch to working on a new color. And finally, I switch to my size 14 round brush and I'm doing my color activation in the cast shadow shape. And with that, it is time to move on to layer number three. I of course allowed everything to dry completely once again before continuing to layer on more pigment. And what I'm doing with this third layer is I am focusing on only darkening the darkest dark areas. I'm going in with both my medium color that I chose for the area on hand as well as the darkest color that I chose for the area on hand. And I'm gonna be working on pushing that contrast with my darkest color 
And of course, I can always go back to my medium color if I need to work on transitions, softening gradients. If I need to make highlight sections a little bit smaller, I can also do that. I can use both colors to help me continue developing a little bit of that visual texture in the cake section using that scribbling technique. But the main objective with this third layering is to increase the tonal contrast, which is going to really make the cupcake pop. In other words, we're continuing to expand that range of values and developing darkest darks. But of course, you can always go back to that medium color or even the lightest color if you need to, to help you soften transitions or whatever it is that you need to do. I always like taking little breaks and coming back to see everything as a whole from a bit of a distance and making sure that there are no stark looking marks, lines, or solid heavy shapes because if so, I need to go in and soften them in some way, whether it's by creating a softer transition between the values inside of that mark, line, or shape, and around it, or even going in with one of my erasers to soften edges. I also want to make sure that I'm staying away from the look of outlines anywhere throughout this piece. Here I'm doing some work in the paper cup section. I have my darkest brown on hand, and I'm going in to push those receding areas in between those bumps or those triangles that are coming forward. At this point in the process, because we're focusing on creating those darkest darks, I am allowing myself to go in with a tiny bit more pressure. I still wouldn't call this burnishing because I'm not pressing down super hard, but I am going in with a little bit more pressure than I was before. You can see how here I am darkening that section nearest the cast shadow opposite to the light source right here on the lower right of the cupcake. Here I switched to my dark gray and I'm going to be darkening some shadow areas of the paper cup, making sure that I'm not adding any gray into those areas that I want to make look white. These are just little shadow shapes and I'm observing that reference photo to get clues as to where these shadow shapes are within these areas. I quickly go over the occlusion shadow areas as well nearest the cupcake inside of that cast shadow shape using this darker gray, making sure that I'm releasing that pressure as I make my way into the larger cast shadow area which is lighter and then it is time to work on those darker values in the pink icing so first I go in with my pink which is dark flesh for me and I do a little bit more layering throughout the icing to intensify that pink a little bit and to also work on that bridge mid-tone transition between my pink and my darker magenta e colors in the shadow sections. After I added that pink, I go ahead and switch to my darker color, which I'm using in the icing, which is the purple pink. And I do a little bit more layering in those darkest shadow areas, making sure to release that pressure as I make my way into the lighter midtones. Hopefully you can see how throughout the icing, I've left some sections of white paper completely uncovered. So throughout the icing, I have sections where white paper is shining through completely uncovered, which are the highlights. I have a wide range of midtones created by the first pink, and I have the darkest darks created by the purple pink. And then it's time to push that contrast in the cherry. So I switch on over to working with my red, which for me is my permanent carmine, making sure that my pencil tip is nice and pointy. And I'm pressing down a little bit harder to cover up more paper and create those darkest shapes within the cherry. Once I'm done with that, I switch on over to my dark gray once again very quickly to create some darkest shadow shapes within the white candy, especially where there is overlapping taking place. And then I switch between my different colors that I used for the candy sprinkles, making sure that I'm going in with nice pointy tips to create those darkest shapes within those little forms. So as you can see, I ended up with at least a couple or three different values within all of my little candy sprinkles, which is going to make things look more realistic instead of having gone in with one single flat color or value. And finally, we're moving on to the very last phase, and this is an optional phase. Oftentimes when I am working with watercolor pencils, I like choosing what I like calling a wildcard color. 
which usually is a purple or a blue. And I use this color to help push those darkest darks a little bit more. But simultaneously to that, it also helps me integrate things more and create greater color harmony because I'm repeating the same color throughout different areas of my piece. So what I'm doing here is I am using my purple, which is the same purple that I used for the purple candies, and I'm doing even more overlapping in darkest dark areas. So in other words, I am using the same purple to darken those darkest dark shadow areas in all of these different elements which really helps integrate things more and also sometimes adds a little bit more of an expressive, colorful look. So this might be something that you might want to try in the future when it comes to watercolor pencil pieces. All right, you guys, that is going to do it for today's video. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found it helpful. And if you did, pretty, pretty please make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and helps others get to know about my channel. Thank you so, so much for watching today. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that little bell so that you can be notified of when I share my new videos, which happens every single week. Have a beautiful rest of the day and see you soon. Bye guys.